Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's MinMD Real Talk webinar. When ED pills don't work, what's next? My name is Austin Hunt, and I'll be your moderator for this event. I work on the marketing team here at MinMD, and I'm excited to be hosting this session today. Before we get started, we have a short disclaimer we need to review. The health and medical information provided during this webinar, as well as the questions and responses from the webinar providers, are solely for informational purposes. This content is not intended to take the place of advice or treatment from health professionals. Nothing presented in the webinar is intended to be used for medical evaluation, diagnosis, or treatment. It is not intended to substitute for your relationships with your own healthcare and pharmaceutical providers. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider before beginning any new treatment or if you have questions regarding a medical condition. Yeah, with that being noted, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Casey McFraw. Dr. McFraw is a fellowship trained men's sexual health and prosthetic urologist. He specializes in the workup and treatment of erectile dysfunction, Crohn's disease, and male urinary incontinence. and is located in Las Vegas, Nevada. Today he's going to cover the underlying causes of ED, medical treatment options beyond pills, surgical treatment options, and then hold a live Q&A to close out the webinar. So without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming our presenter, Dr. McCraw, over to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day uh, to come learn a little more about erectile dysfunction. So a little bit about me. Uh, I did my undergraduate in Boston at Tufts. I'm from Colorado originally. From there, I went down to the South for a lot of my medical training. I did med school uh, in Atlanta, my residency in urology in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, and then I decided to do an extra year of surgical fellowship, uh, specifically in erectile dysfunction, Peyronie's disease, uh, before coming out here to Las Vegas. So uh, I really appreciate you guys showing up today. Uh, I think that this is such an important topic, and I think this is a great platform to talk about it with because you know, a lot of uh, guys are embarrassed about this and it's something that affects everybody. And so this is a way for people who may not necessarily have uh, sought out help yet to get some answers. Um, so hopefully they can get treatment if needed. So the erection process, I always like to start out with the physiology because a lot of people will come in and ask the doctor, why is this happening to me? What's going on? Um, and to best explain where the problems come in, we first have to understand how the erection works in a perfect situation. So when we're 19 years old and we get erections all the time, basically how that works is we get either a sexual thought or stimulation down below, which triggers nerve impulses. Think of it almost like a spark plug in a car, okay? It triggers everything to get started. When the nerve impulses uh, tell us to start, it relaxes the blood vessels, the arteries, allowing blood to flow into the penis. It relaxes the spongy tissue of the penis so that it can fill up with blood. And the veins that drain the penis, they actually lay on more of the outside. So as the penis fills, it actually will compress those veins, trapping the blood in the penis for as long as we have our erection for. Once we are done with our erection, either we lose interest or maybe we ejaculate, another nerve response goes down telling everything, okay, we're done. So everything constricts. Arteries stop bringing blood to the penis. The spongy tissue constricts, pulling away, opening up the veins. The veins drain the blood off. Our erection goes away. And so that's how in a perfect world, a perfect erection will work. So now let's dive into kind of what happens when our erection is no longer perfect. And so, you know, we'll start with the formal definition. So when somebody says, I have erectile dysfunction, it means that on a regular basis, they are unable to either get or maintain an erection that's long enough for satisfactory penetration with their partner, okay? And, you know, like I was saying before, a lot of men think that they're alone on this island when in fact, it's really, really common. And I see people all the way from 20 year olds up to 90 year olds who are suffering from this, and the statistics show us, I mean, one in five Americans over the age of 20 is gonna suffer from erectile dysfunction at some point in their lifetime. Uh, more than half of men over the age of 40 suffer from some form of ED, all right? And millions of American men, almost 40 million American men suffer from erectile dysfunction. So 
that's the first thing to know is that you are not alone with this. Lots and lots of people are suffering with this and there are treatments out there. And so I urge people to go seek treatment because you're not alone in this. So causes and conditions. Again, we went over the perfect direction. So now let's see some of the things that maybe will interfere with that, okay? In the United States, the two most common causes of erectile dysfunction are gonna be diabetes and cardiovascular disease, meaning heart trouble, clogged arteries, uh, things like that, um, which a lot of us out there are suffering from these as it is, you know, including high blood pressure. I myself, who's young, I had to start a blood pressure medication in my 20s, you know, it's genetic. It's an, I go to the gym all the time. It's not an unhealthy thing. It's a genetic thing and it affects a lot of us. And so it being one of the common causes of erectile dysfunction, it makes it obvious why so many of us and so many men are suffering from this current. Uh, some other causes are going to be medications. So sometimes if people are on like an antidepressant, um, it will really affect their erections. Another thing that a lot of us guys have to deal with is uh, prostate surgery or radiation. So anybody who's had prostate cancer and had to have that treated, either with surgery or radiation, uh, both of those things will affect the nerves that help with erections because the nerves run right along the prostate. And so it's just something comes along with treating prostate cancer, which is really common. And so, you know, the first thing that a lot of us know that's out there are gonna be oral medications. And the two most common medications are Viagra and Cialis. I would say that 50% of the time, maybe more, when somebody comes to me with erectile dysfunction, they've already tried some of these pills um, that their primary doctor maybe prescribed to them. And uh, maybe they didn't work, or maybe they caused uh, some side effects, you know. How the pills work is they basically increase blood flow to the penis to make it easier to get an erection, all right? Um, some people will ask, you know, well, if I take this, am I just going to get erection immediately? No, you still need stimulation, you still need sexual thoughts, um, but it will make it easier for your body to get an erection, okay? Some of the things that prevent people from being able to take medication, the biggest contraindication is if somebody is taking nitrate medicine or chest pain or for high blood pressure. And it's not all blood pressure medications, it's a specific one has the word nitrate in it. The reason for that is they can kind of combine with each other and lower the blood pressure too much, okay? Um, a lot of guys are on alpha blockers for high blood pressure. It's not a contraindication. You just have to talk to your doctor to see if you can combine those. And that's a really, you know, individualized type of thing, okay? The reason that we oftentimes start with medication is one, it's easy. It's just taking a pill. You know, it's not medication uh, that you have to inject in yourself. It's not surgery. Um, and two, they're really inexpensive nowadays. So cost used to be the biggest factor with oral medication back when uh, they were under a patent. And now that they've gone generic, you can get them very cheaply. So that's usually the first thing we'll try. Some of the common side effects that people uh, may have already experienced with them or should look out for are going to be things like headache, um, sometimes getting a blue vision, the temporary back aches, having acid reflux, uh, flushing of the face, things like that. None of them are dangerous side effects, but they can be really annoying. You know, I've had men come in and say, man, if I ever worked, it made me get an erection, but my headache was so bad that I didn't even think about sex at that point. And so even though it worked, it, it's not a good solution because it, it doesn't, you know, give him an erection and make him want to have sex. Okay. And again, so why do some oral medications fail? So, you know, here they talk about like, alcohol with uh, medications. If you drink alcohol or recreational drug use, that inherently are going to make the erections worse at the time. And so it's just going to make the medicine less effective. Okay. Another reason is, is erectile dysfunction is a progressive disease. And sometimes it is just beyond the point that medicine can work. You know, the medicine tries, but the erectile dysfunction is just too progressed for it to work. I really like these red circles over here to the right of the screen. Um, 
And what it's showing is the diameter or the size of the arteries in different parts of the body, okay? So the first smallest circle are the size of the arteries in the penis compared to the circle right below it are the arteries in the heart. So we think about, you know, over time as we age, the arteries in our heart get clogged with plaque and calcium um, and sometimes can lead to heart disease or a heart attack, all right? Well, look at the size of the uh, arteries in the penis. They're a whole lot smaller. So as the arteries of the heart are getting clogged, the arteries of the penis are too, but we will see the effects in the penis far sooner because the arteries are smaller. And so they will clog much faster. And so oftentimes if somebody's suffering with erectile dysfunction, we may also have them check up with their primary care doctor just to make sure that everything's uh, doing well with other parts of their body. All right. Um, another reason why men fail oral medication is kind of like we just talked about. Sometimes they work, but they cause side effects that are really annoying to the patients. And so they want to move on. And so, you know, who can treat erectile dysfunction? Well, your primary care doctor can offer some of the more basic treatments, like we talked about, the Viagra, Cialis. After that, I, I really think that it's a good idea to seek out a specialist like a urologist. And why is that? We have done more training with erectile dysfunction. We know the anatomy of the penis much better. And some of us, like myself, who can uh, consider myself a prosthetic urologist who did, you know, specialized fellowship in erectile dysfunction, um, really can dial down and individualize each treatment option for the patient and do specific workups to maybe see, well, why is your erection, um, you know, happening and causing So these are some of the other treatment options. And we went over oral medication. So what happens when pills fail, which is the, the motto of our talk, okay? So some of the other options, intraurethral gel. What this is, is a liquid medication. It's a lot stronger than Viagra or Cialis, okay? And how it works is we teach you actually how to inject it down into your P-channel called the urethra. Once it's in there, you kind of rub the penis together, the medicine gets absorbed into the penile tissue from within and helps to create an erection by bringing more blood flow in, helping that spongy tissue relax, okay? And again, it's stronger than the oral medications. So this sometimes can be a good option for people if medications fail, all right? Some of the common side effects are gonna be um, burning or penile pain. Um, and there's a rare thing called priapism, which is an erection that lasts for too long. In some men that haven't had a good erection in a long time, they think, oh, well, that sounds fantastic. It's not. After four hours, it can actually cause some penile damage. And so it's something that we really work hard to avoid in people. And so side effect mitigation, or how do we try to avoid some of the side effects with this intraurethral gel? We do really proper teaching to the patient. We counsel them on correct dosing. And I cannot stress that enough that proper dosing is very, very important, okay? Um, and storage, a lot of these medications that aren't the pill, they have to be refrigerated uh, or else they will lose their potency. So intracavernosal injection, I would say probably after the oral medications, this is the next most popular thing that people go to. And what is it? It's a liquid medication that's a lot stronger than Viagra or Cialis. And we teach you how to inject it with a really teeny tiny insulin needle into the side, into the base of the penis, whenever you want to have an erection. Okay. Um, I know the first thing that goes to guys' mind is, oh my gosh, a needle in my penis. But I promise you, it is nowhere near as bad as it sounds in your mind. A lot of the guys who uh, come to my office and get it, and we have a lot of people on this therapy, they say, man, that wasn't bad at all. I was thinking it was gonna be a lot worse. Um, some of them don't even feel it when it goes in because the needle is so small. So this is a really good, effective treatment to try for men who fail oral medication, okay? Um, again, how effective it is, uh, statistics show about 90% of 
people will respond really, really well to this medication. And I think that that's true. I think that most of the time it works uh, for people. In prescribing it, there are a lot of different strengths of the medication. And again, I think dosing is very important and this is why it's important to see a urologist. There are some clinics out there who will uh, you know, give people just a prescription for this medicine without trying it in them, they'll kind of give them a random dose to do at home. The problem with that is if the dose is too strong, the patient could potentially end up with an erection that lasts for too long. Or if the dose is too weak, the patient's now spent money on this medication that doesn't work for them. And so how we do it in my office, I order a sample dose of kind of a mid-strength of the medication, and we actually do a test injection here in the office. And it serves a few purposes. One, you get to see exactly what it feels like to get this therapy, okay? We also get to see, all right, at this dose, how does it affect you? Does it give you a great heart erection that lasts 30 minutes to an hour? Great, it's the perfect dose. Does it give an erection that lasts a little bit too long? Okay, we can reverse it in clinic. We have reversal medication. And then we know to send you home with a weaker dose. Is the dose not quite strong enough? That's great information too. That means that we know that we need to send you home with a stronger dose. We can also teach you proper technique. And we spend a lot of time really teaching the patient exactly how to inject it, where to inject it. And it's really simple, it is. Um, anybody can learn it. Like I said, we have a lot of people doing this therapy, um, but I think it's really important to go through those steps to make this treatment successful, okay? Most common side effects with this one, you can get a little bit of bruising. Sometimes people will get some pain at the injection site. And again, priapism, an erection that lasts for too long if the dose is too high, okay? Possibly other side effects could be um, some development of penile scar tissue. And so to try to avoid that or minimize that, we have the patient move it around in different locations on the penis so it's not going in the same spot each time. Uh, and again, we kind of went through this side effect mitigation. You can only use it once every 24 hours, and this too does need to be refrigerated. Vacuum erection device. So a vacuum direction device, what it is, it's a hollow cylinder that goes on the outside of the penis. Some are manual where you actually have to pump it to create a vacuum in the cylinder. Some are automatic or battery operated where you press a button and it creates a vacuum in the cylinder. And what it does is it sucks blood into the penis and then using a little constriction ring or rubber band around the base of the penis, we can trap the blood in there, okay? This is a conservative therapy, meaning it's not a medication, it's not surgery, it's not an injection. And so it's really good for somebody who says, you know what, I don't really like taking medications. I wanna maybe try a more holistic approach. Um, this is a great thing to possibly try for them, okay? The rates are not quite as good in terms of effectiveness, I think, as the injections are, but they're still not bad, around 60 to 80% effectiveness. Okay. Um, some of the side effects on it, sometimes it can cause some blocked ejaculation where when somebody orgasms, they feel the feeling, but no fluid comes out. Uh, and some people will report some numbness um, or bruising, especially if they leave that penile constriction ring on a little bit too long. And that kind of goes into the side effect mitigation is we want to make sure that we leave that ring on no longer than 30 minutes each time you use it. And again, if somebody is on a blood thinner, it doesn't necessarily mean they can't use this, but it means that, you know, they need to have a very specific talk with their doctor about, okay, this is what I'm on, these are the risks, and do the risks outweigh benefits or do the benefits outweigh risks and kind of decide individually if it's the right treatment for them. So penile rehabilitation and using vacuum erection device for this. This is a really interesting topic, you know, that I think has kind of come to the surface in the past, I would say five years. Um, and it's talked about at a lot of the local meetings and international meetings. What it is, is a lot of times, especially people who have either undergone treatment for prostate cancer, so they've had their prostate removed or they've had radiation and they now don't get erections because of that, or even some guys who, again, their erectile dysfunction is so severe that pills don't work and they're unable to get erectile dis they're unable to get erections from it. This concept of penile rehabilitation is, okay, 
even if we can't cause a full rigid erection that's good enough for sex, can we at least get blood flow into the penis? The reason why this is important is because when people don't get erections on a regular basis, the tissue of the penis is not getting oxygenated fully. And so it actually will cause more scarring. It'll cause shrinkage of the penis, of the penis which is speaking as a man, our greatest fear in life. Um, and so if we're able to get regular blood flow, regular stretch to the penis, we'll avoid some of that scar tissue and we will maintain more of our length. I have a lot of guys that come to me and say, you know, doc, I've been suffering from erectile dysfunction for the past five or 10 years and I was embarrassed um, to come in or I didn't know that there were treatment options out there. And we finally do get them treated and we get them good erections again. And they say, man, you know, I've definitely lost length. I used to be two inches bigger. And a lot of that is, you know, the saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. It truly applies with erections and penile length. If you are not getting good, consistent erections, you will lose penile length. And so I really encourage people when this happens or when it starts to happen, seek treatment immediately. Because one of the things that you'll maintain more is that penile length that you've been used to all your life. And penile implants. All right, so we've gone through pills. We went through the uh, gel suppository. We've gone through the injections and we've gone through the vacuum erection device. So if either pills don't work or they cause side effects, if somebody's tried the injections and they either don't work or they're contraindicated for whatever reason, um, and somebody has either tried the vacuum erection device or doesn't really want to try that, the penile implant will get you a good heart erection, all right? It's the least conservative way to go because it is a surgery, but it is guaranteed to give you a heart erection. And what is it? So it's a surgery where we implant inflatable cylinders into the penis. We put a pump inside the scrotal sac. So all of this is on the inside. You were walking around naked in the locker room. Nobody would be able to tell that you had this device inside of you, all right? When you want an erection, you'd reach down, you'd pump the pump through the scrotal sac. It pumps fluid into the cylinders in your penis, giving you a good heart erection. The nice thing about this device is you can stay hard as long as you want. It almost turns you into a superstar. When you're done with your erection, whenever that is, there's a little button near the pump that you push. It shifts the fluid back out of the cylinders. Your erection goes away and you're flaccid again. Uh, and so it's really effective. And if you look at studies, it actually has the highest patient and partner satisfaction rates at about 92%, okay? Uh, it's outpatient surgery. So you go home the same day. Surgery itself takes about an hour to complete, all right? People always ask, how long is recovery? I would say, you know, for the first week, people are gonna be sore, all right? After that, it gets much better. They can basically start getting back into routine of normal life after about two, three weeks. Once the four week mark hits, that's when they can start using it for sex and go on their way. The nice thing is it doesn't change the sensation that you feel with an erection. So whatever you feel now, you'll feel then. It just gives you the ability to get hard and stay hard whenever you want to, all right? Um, and, and it's interesting, I get a lot of couples that come in that say, well, yeah, you know, the, the injections work or the vacuum erection device work, but we love to travel. We love to go on cruises and it's hard bringing a big cylinder with us or packing, you know, a medication with us. And the nice thing about the implant is it goes where you go. And so it gives couples uh, or individuals that spontaneity back where if they want an erection, it's there with them and it takes 10 seconds for them to get get erect and stay erect as long as they want, okay? So some of the things uh, to think about with the uh, penile implant, all right? One thing is people always ask about their costs. They say, oh my goodness, it's surgery. It's probably gonna be really expensive. Interestingly enough, it is one of the only things that insurance will pay for. So for most people, they only owe whatever their deductible is. And for a lot of people, their deductible is zero. So sometimes the penile implant's actually free for them because the insurance pays for it, all right? 
um, and some of the, the side effects or risk factors, all right? One risk is risk of infection. So like anything implanted in your body, a pacemaker, an artificial hip, if bacteria get on that device and it gets infected, oftentimes antibiotics are not effective at curing it, okay? It's not a life-threatening infection. It's very localized. Usually with this, people will have some, a little bit of penile soreness and maybe some redness, um, but it just won't go away with antibiotics. If that happens, you gotta go back to the operating room, wash out the space and put in a new device, okay? Risk of infection is extremely low. Usually it's anywhere from one to 5%. Um, and some of that, where you fall in that one to 5% depends on health, depends on if you have diabetes or not. Um, but either way, it's a very, very low risk, okay? The other thing we tell people is it's a device that has valves, moving parts. So like your car, like my car, it will wear out at some point and need a tune-up or an oil change, okay? The companies quote an average of about seven to 10 years for this device. I've seen people back at seven years that need it replaced. I've seen people back 20 years later and it's still going strong. Um, but at some point it will need to be replaced, okay? And so whatever treatment somebody is thinking about, okay, I really encourage them to go to a urologist to specifically talk about, okay, this is who I am as a person. This is how long I've been suffering with this for. Let's go over options that might be really good for me because I think that individualized personal relationship is really important. But I also love directing people to this website, edcure.org, all right? It's a great resource for all of the treatments that we just went over. And it has resources to speak with people who have had the penile implants. And so if you're somebody out there who's tried other things and thinks, I might want this surgery, but I don't know, talk to somebody. Let that website um, get you in contact with somebody who's already had one um, so they can tell you, okay, this is what I went through. These are the things that I love about it. These are the things maybe I don't like so much, but it'll be a really good resource for you. So I really encourage people to go to that. And thank you guys for listening to this. So I think that we'll start the questions uh, now. I'm happy to answer anything that you guys have that comes in. There we go. All right, we're there and we're ready. Okay, first question here. What's the difference between a medical VED and a penis pump? Sure, so the difference is probably going to be in quality. It's honestly basically this, the same thing with two different names, okay? Um, a medical VED is usually something that um, you will get from a pharmaceutical company. MedMD sells them. Um, there are other pharmaceutical companies as well that have prescription grade vacuum erection devices, okay? You can also go on Amazon or other websites or adult bookstores and buy penis pumps or vacuum erection devices. They're also called online. And again, the thing that's probably going to differ is going to be the quality. You know, on Amazon, you might be able to find one for $15, which sounds great, but it might cause more, you know, more bruising um, and it may break down more quickly. Um, and so they're the same name, all right? Same thing, different names. It just depends on the quality you're going for. All right, uh, next question here. Is it safe to take both Cialis and Viagra within 24 hours? I did this and it was effective for me. Sure. So, you know, the, the somewhat danger of that is that Cialis will stay in your system um, longer than Viagra does. That's why it's kind of toted as the weekend pill because oftentimes it'll take Cialis about 36 hours to get out of your system. And so, um, you know, if you take a Viagra and then 24 hours later take a Cialis, that's probably fine because the Viagra is probably out of your system at that point. If you take a Cialis and then 24 hours take a Viagra, the Cialis is still probably somewhat in your system. Now, um, you know, when you talk about theoretical risk, uh, it's probably fairly low risk that something would happen because at that point, the Cialis in your system is going to be at much lower doses. However, you know, I always recommend 
um, taking things as prescribed um, by your doctor or pharmacist. All right, uh, next question here. I've tried injections, vacuum pumps, and pills with a combination of all three. I get erect enough for penetration, but not for in and out motion. Do I need to go the route of surgery? Yeah, so it sounds like, my friend, that you've tried a lot of the more conservative options, you know? Uh, and that's the thing. If we can get an erection, but we can't maintain it, that's, that's not good enough. You know, we want a good, hard erection that we can maintain through intercourse and not worry whether it's going to stay or, or, or go away halfway through. And so I think that because you've tried a lot of the conservative therapies, and I recommend that, by the way, because the penile implant is permanent. Once you get it, you can't a year later say, oh, I want to go and try injections again. So I do recommend trying the more conservative therapies first, but it sounds like you've tried them and it sounds like it's not working. So yeah, I think that a penile implant could potentially be a really good option that allows you to um, be able to have intercourse and not worry about it and be very satisfied. All right, next question here. I'm on injection therapy, and when I inject and I'm standing up, I have a good erection, but then I lie on my back and the erection goes away. Why does this happen? Yes, um, so that's a very good question, and it's, it's all positional related. I have a lot of guys, a lot, who the injections work when they're standing, but not when they're laying down, and it all goes to the pressure. When they're standing up, um, gravity is helping. They're able to get a little bit more blood pressure to shut down those veins a little bit better. When they lay down, the blood pressure goes down a little bit, just enough for that tissue to pull away from those veins and open them up so that the blood drains off. And so in this scenario, the options with that would either be have sex standing up, just find positions that work with you standing, um, possibly, you know, on the side of the bed, or using the injections as well as a penile constriction ring or a cock ring that can help shut down those veins a little bit better. So even when you lay down, those veins stay shut and that will hold that erection better. All right, uh, next question here. Is it true that using a VED device before a penile implant will allow you to implant a slightly longer penile implant? That's a good question. I get that question a lot. So I think that the answer is yes, okay? Because remember, like we talked about with the penile rehab, using a vacuum erection device is gonna bring blood flow and it's gonna put stretch on those tissues, okay? And when we do a penile implant, Basically, what we do is we stretch your penis in a flaccid state in the operating room, and we measure that. So a penis that is able to stretch longer can get a longer device that we can put in. The caveat to that is it's, it's not the type of thing where you can use the vacuum erection device, you know, once every few days, a week before your implant, and expect to get, you know, more length out of it. If you want more length, it's the type of thing that you really have to do on a very regular basis, probably twice a day for a few months leading up to that implant because it takes a while to generate that penile stretch. All right. I've been using Viagra for years, but now I'm waking up with shortness of breath hours after using it and my heart rate is elevated. Is this harmful? So, you know, that's what oral medications can do is they can lower blood pressure to an extent. And, you know, when we sleep and get really relaxed, our blood pressure actually drops a little bit more. And so Viagra being in your system and your blood pressure dropping um, may be causing the heart racing, the shortness of breath. So honestly, I would recommend stop taking Viagra and get checked out by your primary care doctor to make sure that your blood pressure is okay make sure that potentially you don't need, you know, a, a workup or a checkup for your heart before restarting that medication. It may be the fact I have some people who 
you know, they've been on a blood pressure medication for years that controls their blood pressure beautifully. And then they add in Viagra and it's just, it lowers it just a little bit too much. So sometimes the answer is, you know, their primary care doctor will back them off their blood pressure medication a little bit, knowing the Viagra may pick up the slack. But I wouldn't change anything until you talk to your primary care doctor, except for stopping the Viagra, because it could be dangerous. All right. I had prostate surgery earlier this year. Will erectile function come back naturally over time with a strict treatment regimen? So that's another great question. So again, we talked about prostate surgery leading to erectile dysfunction because when the prostate is removed, the nerves that run alongside the prostate have to be swept off in order to remove the prostate. Those nerves are nerves that help us get erections and they're inherently injured during that surgery. And so if you look at the studies, studies show that it can take technically up to about two years to see what your new baseline will be in terms of erections, meaning those nerves can heal over time and they, it may take about two years for them to heal. I will say this, if you've gotten to one year and you don't notice any progression, meaning, all right, six months ago, I couldn't get anything. And then four months ago, I was actually able to get fullness with my erections. And now I'm able to get 50% erections. You know, if you're not seeing that progression at about a year, then you may be close to what your new baseline will be. But the short answer is yes, nerves for erections can heal after prostate surgery. All right, next question here. When I have an orgasm, the sperm doesn't come out during ejaculation, but it oozes out two to three minutes later. Why does this happen? So that's another good question. And a lot of guys suffer from that. So it can be due to a few reasons. Some guys with enlarged prostates will have that if the prostate is blocking the ejaculatory ducts some. Other men with enlarged prostates take medication for it called alpha blockers oftentimes. Um, they're commonly known by names of Flomax, Tamsulosin, Rapaflow, Alfuzosin. Um, and what those medications do is they relax the urinary channel, okay, to allow urine to get out more easily. They will also cause something called retrograde ejaculation or kind of delayed ejaculation where you'll orgasm and you'll feel the feeling, but the fluid will either go back into the bladder and you won't see it at all, or it kind of oozes out later over time, okay? Um, and the reason for that is it takes a very coordinated, quick tense of all the muscles in your pelvis and your pee channel, the urethra, to expel that fluid. So when we're taking this medication that relaxes everything, we can't get that coordinated muscle spasm during the orgasm, and therefore the fluid doesn't pulse out. It just leaks out afterwards, or some people don't see it at all, but that's the reason usually. All right, can I gain size with a penile implant? So that's another good question. A lot of people hear implant, and think, you know, breast implants and stuff like that, that it's actually increasing the size. No, it's actually somewhat of the opposite in that with a penile implant, sometimes people's erections will actually be shorter after the implant is placed. Again, it does not happen to everybody, but remember that the longer erectile dysfunction goes on, the shorter and shorter your penis will get just from scarring and that tissue loses its elasticity, okay? And so the implant definitely will not make it longer in the short term. Sometimes if people get a penile implant and then 10 years later have to have it replaced, you can put in a bigger implant because now they've been getting normal erections with the implant and they've actually gotten some tissue stretch over those years. But the initial implant, no, it will certainly not make the penis any longer. All right, uh, next question here. Do you have to do something different for diabetic patients that want implants? I don't think that you have to do anything different in terms of the surgery. The surgery is the same. Perioperatively, we are the same. I treat everything extremely, extremely carefully and I'm extremely sterile in the operating room with both diabetics and non-diabetics. You know, I don't treat anything different with that. 
I think that people who are diabetic can really help themselves by really tightly controlling their blood sugar a month before surgery and within the first month or two after surgery, because that's the time that's at the biggest risk of infection. Once you're completely healed, even in a diabetic, your risk of infection is gonna fall even lower. But it's during that healing process, that first month or two, that it, it is essential that diabetics keep their blood sugar really, really tightly controlled. And I think that is the biggest uh, thing that can help decrease their risk of infection. But no, everybody can get the implant. Um, and like I said, in diabetics, it's a slightly higher risk, but it's only you know two to three percent chance higher than somebody without diabetes. So it's not a huge jump. All right, got another implant question here. Are orgasms any different with implants as opposed to natural? Nope. If you can orgasm before the implant, you can orgasm after the implant. It doesn't change any of the skin nerves, any of the feeling. And so, yeah, you can have an orgasm now. The implant will allow you to get hard and you'll be able to have an orgasm then. All right, uh, next question here. How do some of the treatments you talked about compare to ultrasound or gain wave or P-shot? Ah, so that's a very good question. I love talking about this. Um, and bear with me, because I'm gonna get slightly historical. So I would say probably over the past 40 or 50 years since Viagra, the penile implant and the penile injection therapy um, have come on the market, we have been able to put a Band-Aid on erectile dysfunction, okay? Meaning somebody has a re erectile dysfunction because of blocked vessels, because of scarred tissue, and we can help force an erection in spite of the scar tissue, the blocked vessels and all of that, okay? Some of these newer things that people are hearing about on the market, the P-Shot, which is uh, kind of a plasma that they spin down into stem cells and re-inject it back into the penis. Pulse waves or gains waves are uh, ultrasound pulses to the penis. That technology has actually tries to take a disease state. So a, a clogged artery or scarred spongy tissue that won't expand and reverse it back, push the body to heal that so we can get closer to how we used to be naturally, okay? So it, everybody's been very excited in a lot of the, like I said, national and international meetings over these new technologies um, because they're different than just treating erectile dysfunction. They're actually trying to reverse the disease, which is great. The disclaimers, however, there are some places that will promise the world. They say, oh, this works great. It works in everybody, okay? That's just not true. There's still experimental treatments, okay? So I can't take somebody who has erectile dysfunction due to diabetes and somebody else who has it due to high blood pressure and somebody else who has it you know, due to aging and clogged arteries and know who it's going to work at, okay? We are still ongoing doing those studies. So it's a gamble. It may work in somebody and it may not work in somebody else. I will say that it seems to work better in people with more mild erectile dysfunction. So somebody who can still get good erections, but they have to get them using Viagra, okay? Or somebody who's using maybe a, using a lower dose of the injections. It also will not take somebody and make them 19 again. It's thought to maybe push them back one level. So the guy who can get a great erection using Viagra, maybe it'll push him back to now he can get great erections on his own. The guy who can get a great erection using a low dose of a penile injection therapy, maybe now it'll push him so that he can get great erections using an oral medication, okay? So, so know that, that it's still experimental, it doesn't work in everybody, and it's not a miracle cure. It is very exciting, but it's not a miracle cure, okay? The other caveat is that because it's new therapy, it's really expensive. Insurance doesn't cover it, and it costs around most places somewhere between two to three thousand dollars for the initial six treatments, okay? Which is a lot of money for most of us to spend, especially on something that's certainly not guaranteed to work, okay? So if you're somebody who, who has the money and wants to try it, I say go for it because it won't hurt. But go into it knowing that it's experimental and it may not work, okay? And I will say that also studies have shown better results 
with the shock wave or pulse wave than it has with the P-shot. And so that's just, it, this is a great topic because these things are advertised everywhere because they're a money maker for certain places because they're really expensive. But I get bothered when those places are not realistic with patients that they, they really may or may not work. Okay, so just take that with a grain of salt. Very exciting, new technology, but may not work in everybody. All right, next question here. How do I find a good urologist or prosthetic urologist that will work with me? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and I think that going to that um, website, edcure.org, has actually a physician finder um, link on it that no matter where you live in the country, they can find a really good prosthetic urologist that specializes in penile implants, erectile dysfunction, that's near you uh, and they can kind of help you and direct you to make an appointment with them. So that's a really good question. And I think that that website is a really good resource for trying to find a doctor who specializes in this. All right, uh, how do you choose a particular implant device? What's the difference between malleable and the pump? Sure, yep. So malleable implants are we call them kind of more of a rigid implant. So I always tell people, think about uh, those lamps, a bendy lamp where you can bend the neck and it stays where you put it. That's somewhat how the malleable implant is. There's no pump to it, there's no reservoir, it's just the malleable cylinders that go in the penis, okay? So when you wanna use it, you, you kind of straighten it out and it's hard and you can use it. When you're done with it, you kind of just push it against your thigh um, and put it away, okay? it's really good for people who are either at like a really high risk of infection. You know, maybe they are really bad diabetic and they've just really prone to getting bad skin infections. The malleable implant has a much less risk of infection than the one with the pump, okay? It's also good for people that maybe don't have as much manual dexterity, meaning as much finger strength, um, who may have a hard time pumping the pump because they won't have to pump the malleable. It's there, it's ready for use no pumping involved, all right? Um, those are usually the biggest reasons. I've had some people um, from young guys who are 50, who had their prostates out, up to guys who were in their 90s who wanted malleable implants for various reasons. And, um, you know, they've had good reasons and we put in malleables and they've been really happy with them. The other implant is called the three-piece implant. And it's kind of the one that I, I uh, focused on in the talk where you have two cylinders in the penis that um, are almost like balloons, let's say balloon cylinders, a pump that's in the scrotal sac, and a fluid reservoir that sits under the abdominal muscles. And that one has the working parts. So when you're flaccid or not erect, your penis is floppy. It's like it is in normal life when you don't have an erection. So it's easy to hide. You can wear swimsuits easily with it. Nobody can see you if you're naked in a locker room with it, okay? When you want an erection, again, you have to reach down, you pump the pump, which pumps fluid into the cylinders, allowing you to stay hard. And then you push another little button inside the scrotum to make the penis go down when you're done with it. So it's really good for a lot of people. This is the one we put in most commonly because it mimics a natural erection most closely, but it does take some hand strength to be able to pump it. It does come with a slightly higher risk of infection um, and it will wear out. So the three piece implant may have to be replaced again in seven to 10 years. The malleable implant, because there's no moving parts to it, it never has to be replaced. It, it will last forever. And so those are really the biggest differences. So in deciding which one is best for which patient, it really just takes sitting down with the patient, describing each of them along with the risks, the benefits of each, and, and listening to what they really want out of this implant. You know, there are some people who, oh yeah, I could put a three-piece in, but that's that wouldn't best suit them and maybe their partner, you know. So I really listen to the patient to find out exactly what they're looking to get out of these treatments. And we make a decision together about what's gonna be best for them. All right, next question here. I have a prescription for Trimix and was told I could freeze it for as long as I wanted. And as long as it's not cloudy, it would still be good to use. Is this true? I think that it's difficult with freezing medication because 
you know, extreme temperature changes can change the protein structure of the active ingredient in the medication. So it certainly can be refrigerated. Um, and, you know, oftentimes if, if the proteins denature, it won't necessarily hurt you. It's not like food poisoning, eating a bad, you know, piece of meat, but uh, it usually just won't work. You know, it will be less effective. So can you freeze it? You probably can. When you thaw it out, will it be less effective? Probably, because you're changing the structure uh, pretty severely of the compounds in that medication. All right, uh, next question here. How does arousal coordinate with pumping of the prosthetic? Is there an embarrassing moment? So, you know, that's a good question and it, it all kind of depends on, on the person's situation. So you don't have to be aroused to get an erection with the prosthetic. You, you basically own the prosthetic and if you are, you know, watching C-SPAN or something that's not turning you on at all, you could pump the device and you can get an erection, okay? Um, you can also get aroused without an erection. So they don't necessarily go hand in hand, uh, in terms of the embarrassment, I think that if somebody is in, you know, a long-term relationship and their partner knows they have it, I don't think it's embarrassing. You know, they're, they're used to pumping it up. I actually even have couples who it's part of their foreplay for the wife to pump it up. She actually really likes doing that, you know? So I think that um, if you're in that type of relationship, that's not really embarrassing. I also have guys who are single um, who go on dates and don't want their date to know they have an implant. And so, you know, maybe when they're, you know, starting to kiss uh, or make out or something like that, they'll excuse themselves to go to the bathroom. Maybe it's just saying, oh, I've got to use the bathroom really quickly. And they'll actually pump it up when they are in the bathroom. And so when they come out, they kind of get back into it and they're already erect. And that seems very natural. Like, oh, I turned you on even looking at me and you got an erection. So, I don't think that there has to be that embarrassing moment. And again, all depends on the patient's comfort and the situation they're in on whether, yeah, this is something that they do with their spouse or partner, or this is something that, you know, they do it while excusing themselves in the bathroom. All right, next question here. Uh, if I use injection medication, will I develop a tolerance over time? So that's a good question. So tolerance often means that receptors in your body that the medication works on are, are getting less sensitive to the medication, okay? So I don't think that people necessarily develop a tolerance to the injection medication. I think what happens more often is erectile dysfunction is usually a progressive disease because the arteries that are clogged, they don't stop getting clogged when you start penile injection therapy or when you start taking Viagra. And so something that works this year may not work in two or three years because those arteries are now more clogged or that tissue is a little more scarred than it was when you started that treatment. So I think usually that is, that is more likely what happens. It's not that your body's becoming tolerant to the medicine, it's that the erectile dysfunctioning is, is worsening and you may just need a stronger dose of the injection medicine or a different treatment um, to achieve the same effect. Great. Uh, looks like we've got a few minutes left. So we'll ask a couple more questions and then we'll wrap this up. Um, next question here. I was told that I can take Sudafed if my erection lasts longer than four hours to reduce my erection. Is that safe? So no. So if the erection goes on for, you know, and I honestly wouldn't wait four hours. I think that you should, at the three hour mark, you can try to take a Sudafed. Again, you probably wanna run it by your primary care doctor first. And, and I would run it by them before you get into that situation and just say, hey, am I allowed to take Sudafed if needed? Because in certain people with high blood pressure, Sudafed can actually raise your blood pressure more. So before doing any of that, check with your primary care and just make sure it, it is okay for you to take Sudafed if needed. The theory behind Sudafed is that for best erections, we think of max relax. So our vessels relax and expand to bring in blood. Our tissue relaxes and expands to accept the blood. Our penis gets hard, okay? 
And so Sudafed, what it does is it actually causes things to constrict. That's why we take it when we have colds because it will constrict the blood vessels in our nasal passages, which make less mucus and therefore less phlegm and less runny nose for us. It'll do the same thing in the penis. It'll start constricting the blood vessels in the penis. And sometimes, yes, it will work to bring down erection, okay? So if you've cleared it with your primary care doctor and you had an erection lasting about three hours, I would try it at the three hour mark. But I would try to take one. And if your erection does not go away by four hours, then you need to go to the emergency room to have it reversed with something that's gonna be stronger, okay? Um, because after four hours, you can start developing some tissue damage because that blood in the penis starts running out of oxygen. All right, last question here. Does regular masturbation with a VED or penile pump help for erection therapy? So again, yeah, you know, I think that the, the, the vacuum erection device does help to get blood flow to the penis. And I think using it as instructed definitely can, can help maintain more of that um, good penile health, good erectile tissue, and potentially even help with erections. I think when people run into trouble is when they try to inflate it too much, you know, they get a lot of bruising when they use it, or they try to leave that penile constriction ring on for too long. Because remember, when you do that, you're compressing the vessels. And that's what we want when we're trying to hold our erection, you know, for 30 minutes or less. But I see people run into trouble when they, when they really crank that vacuum too much and try to overexpand their penis, or they leave that penile constriction ring on for too long. All right, with that, I'd like to thank Dr. McCraw for taking the time to present today. And we'd also like to thank everyone listening for attending this MinMD Real Talk webinar. We hope it was informative and you'll join us again in the future. If you'd like to learn more, you have a few options here. You can find more resources in the Resource Center on MinMD.com or visit the page to view instructional videos, guides, expert articles, and more. You can also schedule an appointment with a MinMD clinical case manager. To do so, you can call MinMD at 857-233-5837 or log into the Password Protected Secure MinMD portal. And finally, you can learn more about penile implants and insurance coverage by visiting edcure.org. We'll also be sending a follow-up email with references to helpful resources and links to each after the event. I'd like to thank everyone again for attending today's webinar. We'll see you at the next one. Thanks, everybody.